No, 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 no. That was my initial reaction when I first started the game, because Bethesda is notorious for its drifting from game to game bugs and lame plots. However, after a while of playing Starfield, my opinion changed to this. Having fun? They say Starfield is truly one of the games, or a loading screen simulator, or a Fifty Shades of Boredom. I don't share those opinions, maybe I will be the devil's advocate, because at the end of the day, I ended up liking Starfield, because I've got exactly as promised, stars and fields. No, I don't say the game is a snorefest, it has its ups and downs, but it was enough for me to keep me engaged and amused throughout the story. So if you didn't, upgrade your PC for this game, or you couldn't fight the boredom of the first 12 hours, or you are a current player, this video video might help you to understand the whole plot of the game. Give a like if you find the video entertaining or useful. Deal? Let's go! It all starts in a deep mind with me, the fuck. My boss, Lin, gives me instructions on how to do my direct responsibilities, to mine rocks. My shift only takes a minute, and then I wait a little more, until the excavator clears the way and we come closer to a mysterious artifact. After touching I experience what I call picking the most flavored Pringles chip that makes you melt while traversing through the universe. The fuck happens to him next is a secret, but he wakes up naked, surrounded by his co-workers with a burning sensation in his ass. Nobody knows the fuck's real name, or cares, or listens, or asks, or… So everybody calls him Dusty. He picks up his mining suit and goes outside from a dusty mine to the dustier surface. I see a landing ship and come closer to steal everything that is not nailed down. Then I meet a guy, Barrett, and his sexy robot companion. Robot. Lin and Barrett are discussing some old business, but who cares? Look at those strong hands, powerful shoulders, and those two pairs of long legs attached with tight screws. I can't wait to fiddle with his wires. When those two human meat bags stop bitching, we hear the noise of another ship landing behind. This time it's a pirate ship of the Crimson Fleet, and those pirates are eager to die on this planet because their AI won't let them do anything else. Saving everybody's butts and most importantly that shiny metal ass, Barrett invites me to constellation because I had visions from the artifact. Turns out the Crimson Fleet was changing Barrett's ship, and they were after some treasure inside it. Because of his fault, he agrees to stay on this planet and clear the mess he started, and in return, he will give me this beauty. His name is Vasco, and his spacecraft, the Frontier. On top of it, he gives me the watch that can open the lodge, a place where the constellation robo orgies take place. Well, at least that's what I imagined it was. Later Bart explains, in fact, constellation exists to discover secrets of the universe, and they are looking for the artifacts because they are of great importance and can unfold mysteries of the universe. In a few words, waste of time. I land in New Atlantis, one of the richest places in the universe, with just about anything you need. My destination is the Lodge. That's where Constellation members are waiting for me. Uh, this is just typical. Barrett hands over our ship and our robot to some random employee of that discount mining outfit he uses. Or not, this is Walter, a local Elon Musk who is funding the constellation and buying all of the adult toys they need. By the way, he's a pretty nice guy, but right now he's being suspicious of letting a random nobody into their private organization. But trust me, eventually you would wish to spend as much time with him as possible. This is Sarah Morgan, an ex-military captain who suffered a tragic loss in her past. Many players despise her because she doesn't like injustice, like stealing, killing the innocent, avoiding paying taxes, or burying your parents alive because they are ugly, but she was tolerant of me, so eventually I married her and occasionally get late for an XP boost. So Constellation is an active search of the artifacts and we've got a new lead. Sarah has an old acquaintance who heard about a guy who was boasting about the artifact he'd found. It had been on Mars, where we jumped next. The local barman knows the informant's whereabouts, but he's not going to give it for free. He needs credits. Sarah and I persuade him that if he doesn't give us information for free, I will reload the last save file and repeat my skill checks and until he tells me what we need. He spits out that the informant is Moara, and his signal got lost somewhere in space. But a satellite beacon recorded his last grav jump. The beacon is a barbecue spot for local zealots of the House Varun, who believe the Great Serpent will come back home one day and eat all sinners. Until then, I need to sneak through their ships and collect the data from the satellite. Peace is the only option, because my ship is too fragile and there is no way I can win this fight. I need to come up with something smart. How about flying slow? 
slow in space so the enemy doesn't spot your burning engines in the dark while you listen to their prayers about heretics. Feels as fun as being at the party, listening to a mute guy who reads encyclopedia out loud. And out of respect, you don't interrupt him until he finishes. And he never does. From the logs we collected, turns out Moara's ship was captured by pirates, and I have to destroy the engines to board his ship to give him a hand. Sarah says I must be careful not to blow up the spacecraft, or we will lose the artifact. But I've tried, and it's indestructible. I get inside, put down to rest all bad guys, and take the artifact from Moana. Funnily enough, we don't take him on board, but leave him to die, pointlessly drifting among stars with broken engines. Later I found him alive in the bar on Mars, though. I return to the lodge, and my team tells me that Barrett is completely fine and enjoys himself on Victera. That doesn't sound alright. Bloggers said that Starfield is boring, so nobody has fun until I find all the artifacts and ruin a few innocent lives along the way. I immediately travel to Victera and yell at everybody so they quit having fun. Starfield is for the dead inside. Turns out nobody actually did. I'm glad. But Heller and Barrett were kidnapped by the pirates. Thanks to Barrett's intrusiveness, the pirates don't have fun either. After a few minutes, I learned how it all started. The other day, the pirates landed on this planet again. Heller and Barrett just took a peek inside the ship, when suddenly the pirates closed them inside and Graf jumped elsewhere. Later I received his distress signal where Barrett asks for rescue. He and Heller pretended to fight each other. Then two pirates decided to step in to avoid unexpected deaths. That's when Barrett took away a pirate's gun and started blasting. It caused the crash of the ship on a star. Heller made it. However, Barrett was kidnapped again by the pirates' backup. I'll track their signal as always, but first we need to save Heller, because he is dying from internal injuries. That's when Sarah is eager to speak about how the fuck I felt when I touched the artifact. What the heck, we have the guy dying, and you interrupt me with this nonsense? And I kid you not, characters constantly do that. Not only do they ruin the immersion, but even conversations, speaking simultaneously with a key character. Ah, it would be a shame to just pack up all the modifications. Three of us lick Heller's wounds, and I kick him out somewhere, and load screen to another pirate's outpost. Until now, I've been playing on a hard difficulty, but it felt as simple as luring children into your basement with sweets, so I changed the difficulty to very hard. The game got a little bit more complicated, as well as teenagers who don't fall for sweets as easily. Barrett is kept hostage. Having eavesdropped their lovely talk, I questioned my part in this mission. Barrett was doing great on his own with Without me. Anyway, I sped the rescue up a little and gave Barrett a hand. Since Barrett is safe and sound, we jump back to the lodge. There we've got a visitor, Sam Co and his daughter Coraco. They always travel together, because paying child support is more expensive than risking your life on a daily basis. Sam is something of a space cowboy, a member of the constellation and a descendant of Solomon Co, the founder of Aquila City, where we jump next, because Sam's father, Jacob, keeps a map of supposedly the next artifact. How convenient. But we can't just borrow the map, because their relationships are far from good, so instead we sneak into Aquila's bank that was going through armed robbery by a local criminal gang. Jacob must keep his map in the bank, as he always did. I lockpick every possible lock, stealing anything that has a value of more than zero credits. <laughs> This'll make a good story. Wasting about an hour of my life and leaving the criminal gang with nothing. Now that bank is completely empty, but we still need the map. Sam agrees to look his fears in the eyes. We convinced Jacob that if he didn't give us the map, I would resell his property to local merchants, which I had already done by that time, so he agreed. The map points to the local mine where the Shaw gang is hiding. I shouldn't explain what happens next. <laughs> Going outside, I am ambushed by the leader of this gang, Shaw. You. This is your fault. You better lend us a hand. Anyway, at some point of the story, I was so obsessed with collecting all these artifacts that I was ready to get rid of any member of the constellation if I needed to. Call me a maniac, but. Uh... Well, no excuses, feel free to call me a maniac. At the lodge, they speculate on what those artifacts are and what those visions mean. The next stop is a cutting-edge spaceship built by the constellation, the Eye. This machine was designed to watch the galaxies for the artifacts. The pilot of this ship is Vladimir Sal. Even though he is an ex-Crimson pirate, he's a pretty nice guy and from the get-go he gives me his keys from his villa in a distant galaxy. Perhaps he knew I was going to rob him anyway. That's how you make friends, guys. Just give me everything valuable and 
and I will be your best friend, I swear. He says the artifacts will wait because another member of constellation needs our help. Andresia, a headstrong woman and an ex-pirate too. What a nice company we've got here. Ex-pirate, a current cold-blooded marauder, thief, murderer in my free time, and Sarah. She is cornered by the ecliptics, something of mercenaries ready to work for a loaf of bread. They don't really try hard, which makes sense with their wages, so Andreja, Sarah and I get rid of them relatively easily. I added another artifact to my collection. I gave Andreja a try and traveled with her for a while, but after some time I realized she felt like a companion I couldn't care less about. So crying my eyes out and begging for forgiveness, I return to Vasco. Next, Vladimir notices a huge source of fat anomalous noise from one of the planets. It can be an artifact or some space current. My bet is the first option, so without further ado, I grab jump there. Here, after having been led by developers' hands throughout the whole game, for the first time I must think on my own and figure out where the static comes from. It is actually a big deal, because at that point my brain turned into jelly, so unchallenging the game was. So after about 2 hours of running around, shifting into madness, playing with snow, screaming at the endless space and scanning the fauna, I gave up and googled what I was supposed to do next. And trust me, the missions log that says follow distortions on the scanner doesn't help. There are a bunch of distortions around due to anomalies. Your goal is to climb the biggest mountain or jump on the roof of your ship and look for the weird temple. That's your destination. There in the temple you will finally become the dragon uh, I mean you will acquire extraterrestrial powers. To become Come closer to God, follow the lights in the air, and you will be able to create zero gravity spots for a limited time immobilizing enemies. It's not my place to judge Bethesda's choices, but is the first superpower supposed to look so insipid to turn off your sense of adventure? I wish I could say I constantly use this ability. However, in fact, it felt so useless I forgot about it the next second and hardly discovered other abilities. Simply put, I didn't see any sense in looking for those magic temples, but I could finally form my opinion about the rewards I was getting for most of the main and side quests in Starfield. It felt like this. I was too naive to expect something epic at the end of missions, when in fact I've been getting Todd Howard spits in my face. Sometimes I enjoyed it, but mostly I didn't. Back at the lodge, everybody was astonished to see my new powers. Lucky them, everybody agreed on keeping that information secret, because you never know how some greedy evildoers might exploit my superpowers. For example, hire me as a crane to lift materials up to the higher floors, crane hunters are after my useless ass, and when I was ready to bitch a little more, something extra Extraordinary was getting started when Walter Stroud, instead of killing dozens of people for artifacts, offered me to simply buy an artifact for a change. And that mission turned out to be eye-opening how great Starfield can be at times. Walter's informers have information that a seller of the next artifact is going to the city of Neon. The artifact is highly likely stolen, so we might pull ourselves into trouble after the deal is over. Troubles are not new to me, so without a second thought I throw Walter in my ship and we jump to Neon. That's where I felt Cyberpunk 2077 was outmatched. Neon is placed on a water planet with endless downpours. Moreover, bolts of lightning hit anything on the planet every now and then, so scientists came up with a genius plan to install the grid that collects and accumulates lightning energy and powers up the city. Inside it looks rather lovely. It's clear what Bethesda took inspiration from. Like us, Walter has an HQ of his company in Neon, so I get a chance to visit his offices and feel what his employees feel. Minimum wages. There we get to know Walter's wife, Isa Eklund, who is a co-CEO of the Stroud Eklund Ship Manufacturing Corporation. At first their relationships look rather cold, yet in fact those two learned how to separate their business and personal life. At work they are strict co-owners and after work – lovers. This is supported by their private speech, their tone of voice changes from strict to caring. Next we need to prepare for the transaction. The seller is shady, so we bribe the security just in case the deal goes west. After that I need to hack into the meeting room's computer to control the doors remotely. If the seller decides to run, then I need to cast light on the past of the seller. Properly speaking, go through his dirty laundry and find out what's what. Turns out the guy used to work for another spaceship company and stole the artifact. He's got a few days until his work accounts got deactivated and the missing artifact is spotted. He's desperate and clearly is not the person we can negotiate the price with. When the preparations are ready, we go to the nightclub with these beautiful creatures. It's not something I'm used to seeing in such futuristic clubs. Where are the girls or T-Pose people? There we're looking for a guy with a suitcase big enough to carry the artifact. When we find the supposed seller, I need to say the code phrase. Go fuck yourself! 
I mean Ramsey and Travers. I found him pretty fast, the club is small and there are only a few people with suitcases. We agreed to see one another later in the meeting room. Before that, Walter explains how business works. Usually dealers will ask for twice more than we agreed on. As leverage, he'll probably try to walk out too, but again, we know his desperate position, so he's running out of time, that's why we call the tune here. We get together in the meeting room and the seller offers me to sit down because you see, I make him nervous. He hasn't seen my big guns yet. I felt no pity or reason to make him comfortable. Musgrove starts haggling for the doubled price. I close the door and he panicking calls for security. And again I play a winning card and explain that we have an understanding with the security. So there is nothing he can do but to pay the price Walter haggled out. Eventually he backs down and agrees to the money. Now the artifact is ours. Outside the room we are faced with Slayton Aerospace's agent, the arrival of the Walter Strouds. He's after the artifact that has been stolen and either he or other agents will come after it. Well, we'll see that. I call the guards and they calm him down. By the way, why does he look like a raider from the wasteland? The simple answer is to feel no sympathy towards him and eliminate him with no mercy. In my opinion, it's a cheap trick to make me feel okay when getting rid of these guys. We pick up the artifact and head on our way out. Isa, who is waiting for us in the club, is on edge, as far as the CEO can be. The founder of Slayton Aerospace, who we bought the stolen artifact from. Nikolaus Slayton blocked us in Neon and has impounded our ship. As they say, there is always a bigger fish, but this time it's not Walter. We can fight or act diplomatically and go straight to Slayton's office because their HQ is placed in Neon too. There is tension in the air and even Slayton's security is freaked out. You can see that guy's HP bar, which indicates he means business. You can go berserk or persuade the receptionist that I have an important topic to discuss. I chose peace because I saw no reason to fight and I believe it was the right choice. Otherwise, I wouldn't see what was coming next. The receptionist lets us in and we take the elevator. And then this happens. Walter, what you take away? <sighs> Slayton believes we took something of his. No way, we bought it so it's ours now. Cast iron evidence of my words is this 21st century shotgun that doesn't listen to counter statements. The possible bloodshed is interrupted by Isa, who pays off Slayton's security consultants and hacked in. Now she's our guiding light to get out of that mess. She opens the elevator's door and leads us to Slayton's office through vents by voice commands. Eventually we sneak into Nikolaus's lobby. He greets us with a backup and Walter, to avoid further reputational damages, offers Nikolaus a business solution to share a part of the market. Slayton gladly accepts it and leads us to his office. There I am quite surprised to see the wounded Musgrove lying on the floor. Slayton gives us a choice of what we should do with the thief next. I wonder why it is our business. But ok, I feel like a merciful judge today. He must pay for his mistakes, so I convince Slayton to turn Musgrove in and let him leave. Everybody agrees on it and we peacefully come home. After that, I understood that Bethesda can come up with a decent character and his background if they want. We jump into the orbit, but before a graph jumped, we are interfered by an alien ship of an inexplicable form. They call themselves the Starborn. They demand to hand over the artifact, otherwise all of us will turn to dust. What? You know how much I sacrificed? This is ridiculous, we are trying to figure out who they are and what those artifacts are, but get no answers. Instead, the Starborn turn hostile and I have to flee. There is no way I can triumph over that miraculous spaceship, so I immediately grab jump to the lodge. Back at home, everybody is spitting their wits against the secrets of the Starborn, spaceship and the artifacts. At the end, they've come to a conclusion that those guys are space travelers or people who left the Earth first, made a few groundbreaking discoveries and developed faster than anyone could imagine. Yet, the question still remains, why do they need the artifacts? That's where the fun begins and soon all mysteries will be unfolded. I decided to take a little break and help Sarah to bury her painful past. She used to be a captain once. Going through a debilitating battle, she started to lose her men. Eventually, those who could fight went down and others tried to save their lives in an escape pod. But the last thing she heard was the pod's explosion. She had no choice but to flee, leaving her team's bodies behind without proper burial. The escape didn't go according to the plan and her ship was hit. And then she crashed on an uninhabited planet. She couldn't send a distress signal because the equipment was damaged. So she had to survive alone for a year, fighting and hunting for life. Somehow, she managed to fix the radio, send a distress signal and later get saved. Sarah had been constantly interrupting me to speak about the events of that battle. Now she's finally made up her mind to go back and retrieve the bodies to bury them with honor. We jump back to the ill-fated planet and we find no bodies. Instead, we catch a signal from the escape pod. Following it, we see a hut built on the remains of the pod. We enter inside and what we see next utterly surprises me. This amazing comic book that reduces
reduces O2 consumption while running over encumbered. Ah, and also this girl is Sona. She explains she is the daughter of Sarah's best soldiers who were in love. In fact, the pod didn't explode. It was the crash that Sarah heard. These two lovers survived the crash and then Santa left them a truly remarkable present under the Christmas tree. Sadly, the girl is left alone. Her parents have recently died and she is on her own now. We try to convince her to come with us. Total randoms who could be cannibalistic maniacs. No wonder Sona flatly refuses our offer. However, she says where her parents are buried. And Sarah asks me to collect their personal belongings to bring them to the sacred ground of fallen soldiers in New Atlantis. I do as I am told and look for their graves. Turns out there are 10 graves on the hill, so I collect their dog tags and return to the hut. Hearing Sona screaming at Sarah at the top of her lungs and asking her to leave her alone, I realize the negotiation is going smoothly and wait a little longer. Surprisingly enough, Sarah needs a hand with the girl. Well, count on me, I am the best at convincing children to follow me to unknown places. After my skill check, she agrees to leave that god-forgotten planet, because there is nothing to hold onto anymore, and her parents will never come back. And if they do, she needs a big f shotgun to explode those zombies' skulls. We jump in my white van with candies and leave this place for good. From now on, Sona is an official member of Constellation, who nobody seems to notice. I mean literally, there are no new quests or interactions with the girl after you exhaust all the dialogue lines. But now Sarah is at peace with her past and she is ready to open up. She admits that her feelings for me are candid and she is in love with me. That's why I gladly propose to her. Our wedding takes place in a wonderful place called Paradiso. She invites her bossy mom and her military teacher, ex-constellation member Aja. Even though I chose the perk to have parents at the start of the game, I didn't have an option to invite them too. I suppose I was adopted after all. It's going on quite cozy. And after we get officially married, newlywed us got back to business. After some time, Vladimir tracked down another artifact on the ship of a Grand Collector, Captain Petrov, surrounded by armed to the teeth mercenaries and spacers. Again, Bethesda used this cheap trick portraying these guys as scum, so I don't feel sorry about killing them. Mr. Petrov doesn't seem to part with the artifact, so I have a few options. Attack him at sight or persuade him to show me around so I know what's what and where he keeps the most valuable items. I choose the latter and we take a stroll to the vault. There, he shows off his collection of space items, but I need only one, the special one. I try to persuade him one more time to sell it to me, and even under pressure of a considerable price, he doesn't crack. I have only a few options left. Grab the artifact and run, or kill everybody on the ship. If you are still watching, you already know me, so I start shooting. I kill the guard first. Mr. Petrov is the second on his way to heaven. When he receives a few rare lead items in the collection concentrated in his chest, he gives up and agrees to give the artifact away for good without fighting. However, as an exquisite collector myself, I can't let so many precious items go. I grab my new gun, which used to be Petrov's, and kill everybody on the ship, including him, even though he is friendly. Later on I thought it would affect my quality of life somehow. But no, nobody was hunting me or causing trouble, like it was nothing. Ok, I guess. Back at the lodge, Noel gets a distress signal from the eye. The Starborn attack them and there is a battle going on. From here on I have two options, stay here, in the lodge and protect the artifacts I've been collecting and killing for, or give up all my hard work to secure the eye. I decided to stay in the lodge because I believe constellation members are seasoned enough to withstand the ambush. So when my choice is made I hear Walter choking. Surprisingly enough this time it's not an artifact he was trying to swallow and develop superpowers. But the starborn hunter, he attacked us from inside the lodge in the highly populated and secured city. It's reckless of him but it catches me off guard. And he finally gives me a hard time. No weapon at my disposal is dealing enough damage. So we escape through the back door. All the time the hunter was was chasing us, I felt excitement I've never felt in Starfield before. At last, I heard the boss music in my head. He shows us all he means business, blowing up everybody around and causing havoc. We run to the ship to escape this madness. The police seem useless, whereas the hunter seems to be immortal. Then happens something Bethesda insane. While fighting, the cop arrests me for a bounty on my head and stolen items on my hands and sends me to prison. The Starborn are so superior, they can outsmart the law. I did my jail time for two minutes and realized my mistakes, I swear. On the eye, I face the consequences of my choice. Sarah is murdered and Vladimir is heavily wounded. I can't accept such fate and, well, Sarah is one of a few characters I feel less indifferent about. So I reload the game and choose the first option to jump to the eye and save the day. When I do it, I see everybody alive. There is no fight whatsoever, but they are still wounded. Then I jump back to the lodge. Inside, it feels too quiet. It's because Sam Coe was murdered instead of Sarah. Oh no! 
true. Anyway, Walter, Vasco and Noel are fine and somehow this guy is well too. Noel insists on a burial ceremony of Sam and gathering at the lodge after a week. However, as you know, time runs differently in space. Spending a few days on one planet means a month passed in another solar system. Well, this fact is completely irrelevant as to why I skipped the burial. I was keeping time until vendors replenished their money stocks to make big bucks. The first rule of fun in Bethesda games – screw moral principles. Since now we are trying to understand what the unity is. We which the hunter was speaking about. This is Matteo, a member of a local cult of tin foil hats, believing in some celestial enlightenment. Despite being a regular Joe, he tried to steal an artifact from Walter Stroud, who he used to work for. Later he was caught and his and Walter's worldviews aligned and Walter eventually invited him to Constellation. However, I'll be honest, mostly he is useless and starts quarrels in our team. Let me get it straight. All members of Constellation are people of science or believe in material things, so he feels out of element to me. Although I spent the whole game trying to justify his existence, I failed. At the end of the game I didn't get the philosophy they were trying to teach and his role in the constellation. And I bet if somebody accidentally ditched him in outer space, everybody would sigh a breath of relief and forget him the next second. Matteo approaches his teacher and ideological leader, Keeper Aquilas of the Sanctum Universum. Together we interpret an old legend of the legendary pilgrim who walked every corner of the universe and found the unity. Having decrypted numbers from the legend we revealed the coordinates of a planet. Upon arrival I came across a monument with a glyph on it. The light shows me the constellation Scorpius and the target on its tail. That's where I grab jump next. The hunter's ship is already waiting for me there. The hunter is caught off guard this time though. He welcomes me inside his ship, calling it a ceasefire. There are two of the starborn. One of them is the hunter and the other one is the emissary. The guy who demanded the artifacts first and then attacked. They both come to the conclusion that using force against me is unwise, as I always come back. They explain that they are no different from each other. The Starborn attacks everybody who has the artifacts at sight, whereas the Emissary warns Seekers off by attacking them. The Hunter believes anybody who's got the artifacts can keep them. Uh, why did he attack me time and time again then? Their mission is to keep the artifacts from unworthy, because it opens the way to the Unity. The Unity is some kind of a gateway where the Starborn is reborn. And then out of the blue, in the middle of his speech, the emissary reveals his true face. Sam Co. Anyway, the Starborn used to be the mortals once, before they found the Unity and got reborn. Each of them gets those fancy ships and suits as freebies. So, Sam Co from my universe was killed, but somewhere in a parallel universe he got reborn. In fact, in every universe the Starborn are fighting for the artifacts. To reach each of the universes possible, discover every temple to become the pirate king, I, I mean god. So they stop at nothing to find them all. And it doesn't matter how many innocent people would die. Guys, I have bad news for you. You may be immortal, but your super celestial powers suck. Trust me, I've tried. And you still bleed and get killed by a big boomstick that says... <laughs> the hunter puts his two cents in and shows his real face. He is Keeper Aquilus. Wow, those two give me a choice. Join the hunter and fight for the artifacts until there will be only one starborn left. Or join the emissary's boys band and decide who is worthy of the rebirth and who is not. Well guys, I have a good feeling about this. I'm gonna kill you both. Because what kind of choice is that? Killing everybody who is unworthy or killing everybody who is not worthy enough? As the hunter said, they are all the same. And he was right. I have no desire to join anybody of them. For me, they are merciless murderers, the ones I see in the mirror every morning on my spaceship. So, after all, that's what I've been chasing after. Being reborn into a supreme version of myself and running through each of the universes, opening those super ass boring powers and then becoming a morally bankrupt war machine. <laughs> well, I don't need the unity for that. They let me go because we are destined to meet again. But first, they believe I should discover the secrets of old Earth. First, I grab jump to Earth's moon, where I find logs of the trailblazers who tried the grab jump first. The experiment was shrouded with mysteries and questions. Questions. That's why I needed to come closer to the epicenter, to NASA HQ. Inside it I follow Crumps to unravel the shady story of the first grav jump. It all started with Dr. Victor Isa, who came up with the technology of the first gravitational jumps. He kept in secret pretty much everything. As he reported, they needed first guinea pigs, who would agree to a suicidal mission. They found a team, ready to be turned into space meatballs, and sent them to the moon to try the first gravitational jump. And it was a complete 
success, they jumped and returned in one piece. Next, Victor Isaac got more freedom and money with his technology. The price was that Earth's atmosphere was growing thinner with each graph jump. Having known the price of graph jumps from the Earth to the Moon and vice versa, he kept pushing it to the limits. People in his team were shocked to hear Victor knew about consequences all along. However, he turned a blind eye to those notorious consequences everybody kept squeaking about. A real scientist doesn't see consequences, they see opportunities or a prison cell. In the case of Victor, he's seen multitudes of inhabited planets, people traveling space like it was going out for milk, new human cultures and incomprehensible strippers that would turn viewers' eyes into meat goo. That was worth a shot. If only he knew. You don't need to think twice to realize what convinced a male part of his team to roll up their sleeves. After all, they spent half of their lives working on the project, so there was no way back, only to the future. He was so sure about those because he'd literally seen it when NASA found a gravitational anomaly on Mars. There he found the first artifact. He touched it and saw himself, who described all future pleasures of life. The artifact was later brought to Earth. With it, they managed to develop the graph jump engines, with the price of destroying Earth. Earth. So they started building ships to move all humankind to outer space and into the unknown. Yeah, it sounds lovely and all that, but my force of habit reminds me of itself. I am after the artifacts now. After picking up the artifact, losers and co have arrived on Earth again. The emissary and the hunter want to speak to me. This time, knowing the truth, I pretend like I'm very disappointed about what their people did to Earth. The hunter and the emissary argue with each other. The hunter says it was the right thing to sacrifice Earth into obscure and give humankind kind of fresh start, which I agree with. Humanity is not limited to one planet anymore. They can bring destruction and high taxes all over the universe now. Whereas the emissary is sure, Victor had no right to decide for all people. But hey look, when did it stop any scientist from a new discovery? Call me cynical, but that's our human nature. What are you gonna do about it? Like it or not, somewhere deep in a science lab, there are new weapons of mass destruction people are working on. Never mind, I'm gonna kill them all because they'd been bullying me before. Call it a bullied victim. Team's vengeance. The emissary and the hunter will be waiting for me at the buried temple, some sacred place where the unity and the last artifacts are. But I'm still missing a few artifacts in my collection. On the way to the lodge, I get a distress signal from the lab that is under heavy siege by the local fauna. When I get there, everything seems fine and it feels like a scam. But going inside, I start jumping between two realities. In one, the scientists are studying an artifact in the lab, and it's peace and quiet out there. In another one, there is a sole survivor trapped in in the very same lab, which is completely in ruins. Turns out they're not parallel realities, but time shifts. Due to experiments on the artifact, it fires back, creating the time anomaly. It gets weirder by the second, because I start randomly jumping times, freaking out everybody around. Raphael, who is trapped in the past, was the guy who sent the distress signal. The oblivious scientists are in the present. They know about Raphael's tragic death though, because three months ago there was an accident in the facility down below. Everything blew up and Raphael was thought to be dead, when in fact he is still alive back then. Well, basically in a parallel reality constantly fighting spiders. So jumping between times, I learned that the lab was burned down back in the past, but in the present it's safe and sound, thanks to Raphael who shut down the lab and kept damages inside. Jump by jump I get my hands on the artifact and now I need to make a decision between saving hundreds of scientists in the present or saving one Raphael in the past. Well, the price is high, so I need to act smart because saving one hero or I felt he was worthy because I felt sorry for him. Two parallel realities can't hold together when the artifact was extracted from the lab. So picking Raphael, I condemned scientists to… I don't know what. Anyway, Raphael's reality was the only one left and present. I still don't know what happened to those scientists, but at least they can experience Schrodinger's theory on themselves. With the artifact I picked up, I can finally see the unity myself. I grab jump to the buried temple. Deeper in the temple, I start time jumping again between parallel universes. When I come closer to the hunter and the emissary, they're not going to give up the unity so easily. They use all tricks against me, like making copies of Sarah to fight her. Damn, thanks guys, is it my birthday present? They throw me into a parallel reality where the lodge is being murdered throughout our ruckus. I pick up the last artifact that opens the way to the unity and the best guns in the game. Now I am like a god who deserves to hold all the artifacts for sure.
Sarah is asking if I will love her after I will be reborn. Sure. She is on the fence about her rebirth, because she can do it too. Most in the lodge refused such an opportunity and they'd rather stay in their human form as they are. Makes sense. The more starborn, the more blood will be shed. I'll be honest, knowing what I'll become doesn't excite me anymore. But it's something I have to do now. Another motivation to be reborn is that I will never pay my parents rent ever again. By the way, there is no way to say them goodbye. So I happily move towards the unity. Since I own all artifacts, I built an armillary on my ship. Okay, now what? I go to Google with my question and turns out I just need to graph jump anywhere. That's where the magic happens. I get surrounded by stars and space itself. In the distance, there is an ugly guy and a portal of some sort. When I get closer, the guy turns out to be me. Damn, am I hideous. I see what really killed my enemies. He speaks to me and asks some philosophical questions like if there is something I regret or who the creators are. He doesn't give answers but says that maybe one day I might meet the creators. Well, I've tried, but since then I've got a court order to stay away from the Bethesda offices. Before stepping into the portal and being reborn, I see what happened after my disappearance. The Hunter and the Emissary are no longer a problem. Constellation will publish their data on the Unity, the Starboard and the Artifacts, which will start a new era of space exploration. Sarah Morgan decided to be reborn too. Our love bolstered all relationships in the settled systems, marriages blossom and more children are born to be explorers, but not influencers or YouTubers. That's how the story of the fuck ends in this universe. I step forward to the portal to get reborn. As a reward, I get keys to the starborn ship and a new spacesuit. Beyond that point, I am reborn in a parallel universe. It feels indifferent. After I got reborn into a new supreme being, I tried to complete a few quests, but quite soon I realized I am a higher being. I stopped caring about the lives of those mortals somewhere at the start of the game, and let alone I don't associate myself with them now. Why should I change my mind? At the same time, the main gist of parallel realities is too ambitious. Let's face it, no gaming company right now has the real capabilities or budget to create an authentic parallel universe, where everything would be completely different each you run. Some members of Constellation can be different after you get reborn, yet that's pretty much it. It's still the same box I am as a gamer, trapped to run in circles. As well as the most starborn are. Trying to collect the artifacts to rule the world or maybe reach the creators one day is not my cup of tea. I don't feel the need to endlessly jump between parallel universes looking for something that is not out there. And even if it is. So what? What does it change? In wrapping up, the game felt weirdly engaging while I was playing it. Would I ever play it again? Hell no. The main reason for that is even though the plot felt epic and global, in fact I was making little to no difference to the world. It felt like my own personal challenge to become a supreme being. And that's where it backfired. If in other games you get too overpowered, there is still some drive to complete some quests you haven't done before. Whereas here I felt not just OP, but supreme like a god, which consequently was supposed to start supreme problems, which I needed to solve like a god. Alas, I am a victim of my own expectations. I think the best implementation of reincarnation or rebirth is represented in Dragon's Dogma, which I'm going to post a video about soon. After all, I think Bethesda shot themselves in the foot when they tried to implement countless planets and countless universes, because realistically it's impossible to fill them with unique content right now. Maybe in the future with the help of AI, which I'm not a fan of, but who asked? That's about it. Give me your opinion about the game and see you in the next one. Love you all. Bye.